All right. That's amazing. Good. We are streaming everywhere we need to be streaming. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Magic Mics, proudly sponsored by our Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com, where you can find cool stuff in stock every day. I am Evan Irwin, and we get started as we do each week by saying hello to my two co-hosts, Aaron Campbell. Bonsoir. Ruben Bressler. Bonjour. <laughs> Bonnie Joro. Yeah. Big Jornerson. Holy cow. So we start each week these days with a free giveaway. And so, Ruben, clearly you have to set this one up for us so you right. can talk about what we're giving away and why. So if you look on my back wall here, I'm not sure how well it actually comes through, but uh, I have a D&D &D map that I drew with my dry erase markers. Um and, uh, and and this is something I'm going to be running my players through next Monday, um, and I and I got it from a new release from Dungeons and Dragons that just came out that I was very excited to get. Um, and it and it, for those of you who play D and D, you've probably heard about the release of Tales from the Yawning Portal, which is this book right here. Um, and I was ex extremely excited for this release because most D and D releases are like uh, compendium guides or you know how what the rules to the game are or something like that these are individual um uh dungeons basically um that you can sprinkle out through your already existing campaign they're great for introducing new players they're great for uh adding a, a little bit of historical D, D. these are seven of the most iconic D, D temples and and dungeons that have ever been created um, and so uh, I really highly recommend this book for, for basically everybody. It's got a, some really, it's got seven uh, dungeons all across all types of different levels from beginning to, uh, to uh, mid-level uh, groups up to like level 12. I think you could probably run some of these. So uh, yeah, awesome. Tales from the Yawning Portal. And that's what that is, is that map. And I tweeted out earlier that if you can identify that map, then I'll send you a Magic Mike's water bottle. Yeah, tell me what have been... Uh, Speaking of identifying things, what's that on your T-shirt, sweetie? Oh, this is this is a uh, this is Mr. Rogers, um, <laughs> as, as it should be. And this is my cardigan, and oh, I'm coming yeah. for that. I'm coming for that Twitch cardigan. Is nice. the other thing. <laughs> so if you guys it, ever so. feel like watching any of the um, the Twitch stream of Mr. Rogers, which is running uh, uh, all the way through from May 15th through June 3rd, I think, click on my channel because I'll be hosting it, and then maybe I'll get it. Um, so However, yeah, the way you win the water bottle is you go to Twitter, and whoever responds to me first on Twitter, at MoxRuby, M-O-X-R-E-U-B-Y, and tells me what that room is called put from which campaign. <laughs> right. That room from that campaign. Tell me the room and campaign, and I'll send you a water bottle. Awesome. Well, in the meantime, what we're giving away this week, and I'm going to post the link in the chat. I will need to go post it on Twitter here shortly. We are giving away a copy of Tales from the Yawning Portal because CoolStuffInc.com, sure enough, also sells role-playing games. And Ruben really likes it, and it's a $50 book, and it's totally it's sweet. Great. It's just a fabulous yeah. book. Yeah. It's a really nice one. So we're going to give one away. You guys go there, enter on all the ways to enter, and that'll be sweet. So there was a, there was a pro tour this weekend, yes. and, and we will absolutely get to that. Unfortunately, and and I hate it when when you start with the unfortunately's, like oh this thing trumps this one. Unfortunately, because Helene Bergeau has left Wizards of the Coast. Um, I'm gonna bring it up here. Uh, let's see here. Helen tweeted first. Uh, she said uh, on May 16th, that was yesterday, uh, she said, time to say goodbye. After a great 21 years, I look forward to, to the future and that of magic. Proud to have been part of an amazing community. At which point, everyone was like, what? And just... And... So there was a there was a thread on 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 Reddit clearly you know and Twitter just blew up and lots of lots of chitter chatter in all the different places and uh, and you know uh, I went on Reddit and I posted my thoughts on, on it you know a little bit more extended than I was on Twitter <clears throat> at which point you know people were just like how can you say she fought for the place you know what you can kiss my butt first of all the rear you know what I'm saying. I don't have to prove to you anything that I said in terms of her being fierce, her being unafraid. I have I have seen, I have worked with, I have watched. I've been in magic a long time, people. 
And I, yeah. I can tell you right now, Helene Bergeau fights the good fight. Yes, I know sometimes I'm sure she had to tow the party line. That's what you got to do sometimes. But I know and have seen her advocate and fight for things and fight for people and jump into things. Remember when the Oath of the Gatewatch thing blew up and there was a whole the judges thing and she went on like a podcast to just hit that thing head on? Like that was not something that While I on was... vacation. Yeah, she remember brought... on vacation. Did yeah, I remember she was in a hotel room on vacation and she still found time to call Roberto Gonzalez and be on yeah. his show and explain uh, what was going on with the with the suspensions and everything. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that was incredible and you know like that was that, that to me was just one of the first examples of just like you know what that that that's not necessarily something i feel was in the the job description of during oh, your absolutely. vacation you have to go deal with this weird fire of this guy who was affected by it and somehow wrangle all that together whether it was that or fighting for the players or making sure the grand prix are sweet or the pro tours are nice like this is a thing she has impacted the the world of magic in a very significant way she was one of the four longest uh, uh, longest uh, tenured i guess employees yeah. at wizards of the coast there was only like three or four more people who had been there longer than she had. So so shocking is a word. And oh, yeah. And look, we do, we have no idea how this went down. As far yeah. as I know, neither does anybody else. And that's fine and not that I'm saying we need to know. All I'm saying is there was nothing at the pro tour, you know, if you felt like this was an exit that was planned in some way. There was nothing from Wizards officially in terms of this being planned in some way. So it happened. She's not there anymore. I think that sucks. And I'm going to miss her. And I know Aaron, you're going to have to find <laughs> a new a new impression. I know. This is toughest for Aaron, other than Helen. Well, but yeah. it's toughest for, for Aaron because she's going to have to work on something. She's going to need to find a new new. Uh, so new Aaron's going to Aaron's gonna take the rose water. And Ruben, yes. you're going to have to take something new. That's what's going to we'll work on. All right, on I'll it. work on it. I'll do some do research. <laughs> I yeah, can't I mean, the rose water either. That's fine. It's not, it's not a good impression. I'm just wild. Your rose water is fantastic. Don't sell yourself short. But um, I have several friends who work for Wizards. I lovingly refer to them as my sources. Um, none of them saw this coming. Uh, they all indicated that they found out when we did. Um, when I saw the tweet come out, I literally felt like I'd been punched in the gut. I was just like, no, like I kind of felt like when kids put their fingers in their ears and they're like, no, 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 this is not happening. Um, you know, all of the reasons that you said Evan and more, you know, she has been, she's taken so much of our crap quite quite frankly i mean i can't tell you how many times i've seen her be tweeted in a conversation that she has no control over um i remember when the most recent banning and restricted came out they were like oh lad do something about miracles and she's like i'm going to be for you to met tibet he's the one who handles this and so or how many times i've been at a gp and i've seen some random grinder you know standing alone with her and flailing wildly and helen just listening and taking it and um, you know, like you said, she goes above and beyond the call of duty. And you have to respect somebody who's been there that long um, in any company, um, and especially in the gaming industry. You know, turnover is high. Um, I can't tell you how many people we've seen come and go from Wizards in a sh much shorter time span. So for somebody to make it 21 years, she knows how to play the game. You have yeah. to respect that. Um, and I'm certainly going to miss her as a woman as well. You know, whenever the diversity argument comes up and, you know, people like to say, you know, Wizards isn't doing enough or just the state of women in gaming, to say that a woman was the director of organized play felt really good to say. Like, we felt like she was one of us. We felt like she was our ally. Um, you know, and, and the impression, you know, it's like, you know, we worked so hard on Tennessee that we did not want to distract from what I was about to do. And <laughs> I hope that the players will understand. Uh, and, and I just, you know, I miss her so much and I just love yeah. her. And um, this is sad. This is really sad. It was, it was always great that whenever something crazy happened, whenever the drama hit, whenever there was like a problem, whenever something dumb kind of popped in the radar, I, I, it always felt like you could talk to Helene and at yeah. least she would listen often, you know, sometimes ask some questions, but at least I think would, would yeah. take in and, and not be adversarial and not be no. upset and never felt, I never felt like she got bitter, you know, like, and right. I feel like it's so easy in that job to be just jaded and bitter. And you, you know what, like I've listened to this crap for a decade plus or whatever, like, no, yeah. like she's, she was always there to, to kind of at least respond and explain where Wizards was coming from. 100% agree. And the other thing is that, you know, a lot of what she did that she was iconic for, beyond the fact that she was the organized play director for Magic the Gathering for 20 years or whatever it was. Um, and by the way, if you you should thank Helene for a, 
you know, we make fun of a lot of things in Magic. Organized play is not usually one of them. We have the best organized play of any trading card game. Yeah. Um, you should go check in with, you know, Kaijudo or Force <laughs> of Will or Pokemon or Legend of the Five Rings or Hearthstone, which we'll get to later. Even Hearthstone. <laughs> Magic is consistently the best with yeah. Grand Prix, with Pro Tours, with Regionals, with Nationals, whatever form they take. We can, you know, we can kibitz about the, the minutia of, of it, but it's been successful for decades. And a big part of that is Helen. Um, and so that part of her job, the job description of director of organized play, she was aces. Then add to that, somehow she became the mouthpiece. Somehow, at some point, Wizards of the Coast was like, well, we have to give out this kind of awful information to our players. Who should we have do it? Well, Helen's already at the Pro Tour. People like Helen have her tell all the all the folks that we're canceling a Pro Tour. And then that kind of worked. And then she just became the official spokesperson of Wizards of the Coast for the last two years or whatever. And that's an even more stressful job because now you have people who are coming to her with non-organized play-related issues. And so that's exhausting. Um, you can, I mean, honestly, you can only be in a job like that, uh, in that, under that scrutiny, under those thumbscrews for so long before it gets to you. And you're right, she could have gotten bitter. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, you know, if I were in that job for that long and then suddenly had this happening, and then also keep in mind, Magic Mike's did an exclusive interview with her like six months ago. That's probably oh, the straw that broke the camel's back. <laughs> that was it. That, that was that it. Was... You know, 20, 20 I... years of Magic organized play, fine. <laughs> but I have to talk to these idiots. For an hour. I can't just... do it anymore. Can We're I done. share my favorite Helen moment of all time? Of sure. course. Okay, so I'm going to pay tribute to her here. So um, when I participated in the Community Cup, uh, the community team won, obviously, and we decided that we were going to go do karaoke because Wizards loves them some karaoke. And it happened to be one of those places where you rent the room, one of the little rooms. Um, there was no food or drink available, so we had to get our own. So Helen and I go to this store, and I'm being conservative. So I'm grabbing, like, a bag of chips, a two-liter bottle of soda, and then Helen comes up behind me and grabs a 12-pack. She grabs three bags of chips. I grab a snack tray, she grabs three snack trays. I'm thinking, how are we gonna pay for this? Because I don't have that much money. So we get to the counter, we get to the cash register, we're unloading everything. She whiffs off the company card, and then she Love goes it. to swipe it, and then there's like this hesitation. Like she looks like she's worried the card, the Hasbro company card is going to get declined. Finally, it goes through, and she looks at me, and I'll never forget this, she goes, I love when it's say approved. And I'm like, what? what, 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 what like, like do you really think it's going to decline you? Do you really think That's it's not going to have funds? And every once in a while, I will be at the grocery store and I will just hear her little voice in my head of, I love when, I love when it's say approved. That's, That's awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, every interaction I've ever had with Helen was positive. Um, even when I kind of bum rushed her at the sun, the Sunday. <laughs> Super <laughs> series with yes. AJ Stocker, uh, when we went up there you know, yeah. a year and a half ago and, and just out of nowhere she was super cordial like she wasn't yeah. actually expecting us to be like to call you know be like all right we'll come do it and then in like eight hours that would normally be when she was sleeping she like helped us get set up and was, you know, you know, you're welcome to make videos in this room. This is all, you know, this is available to you. And she could have just as easily said, you know, sorry you came all this way, but you know, we're a Fortune 500 company and you're two guys from Las Vegas yeah. that didn't get approval, you know, ahead of time. She could have easily just said that and we would have been like, well, poop. But instead she worked with us and she always does stuff like this. She's so smart. She can work on, you know, uh, uh, she's on her toes all the time. She's just sharp as a tack um, and always willing to help players and help uh, people who are, uh, uh, you know, player adjacent, you know, coverage folks and artists and all that kind of stuff. And she's just, she, she this is going to be the largest set of shoes to fill at Wizards of the Coast because whoever comes next is going to have to live up to her, 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 her Helen Bergeau's legacy, which is... Uh, to this point has not been replicated in any other game, it, let alone it, Matt. It is significant because, again, because A, she's been there for, for so long, you know, and it's probably the closest to if, you know, Aaron Forsyth 
if Mark yeah. Rosewater, if they right. were no longer at Wizards, it would be an incredibly different experience as a company in terms of yeah. how you would interact with them moving forward. Uh, you know, and and unfortunately, I don't have sort of a sort of the the, the funny story per se, but like I, I for me the my my favorite memory of Helen is when uh, it was Pro Tour Paris, and that was the one uh, Cobblade, you know, for example, yeah. that was the double GP three T mm-hmm. thing, and uh, yeah. and we we went we went and had coffee because at the time I was trying to pitch some ideas for SCG, and we just had a really nice cup of coffee in Paris and got to talk sort of shop and about what SCG was doing, what Wizards was doing, how they felt about organized play at the time, and it was just really nice. And that's Aww. and that's sort of what I got. And that's great. She was, yeah, she she is she is an absolutely terrific person, and um and and I'm sorry to see her go. She's a fierce yeah. queen. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's move on to the pro tour. Now mm. the pro tour happened, and oh my God, Jerry D won the pro tour. <laughs> with dead Literally? things. Yes. Yeah, with dead things. With dead it's, things, Fran and Jerry T for the rest of us. Yeah. Let's let's be clear. No one deserves a pro tour win more than jerry thompson oh man at this point in his career no person no individual person has worked harder done more for the game been a a better force for good within the game and as a has a a bigger fan base has the most clout has done it all like you know and I'm, i'm a little bit shaded on this because obviously i've i've uh, I've been around Jerry so much, having worked with him at SCG, and he helped me get my apartment in Roanoke when I moved down there. I lived across the street from Jerry, nice. um, and I knew him back when he was, you know, level eight on the SCG series circuit or whatever. And I remember <laughs> when he went to Wizards for a brief time to yeah. design the cards. And he's just such a—I mean, a lot of people only see him on camera, right? They only see him in his videos or in his articles or uh, uh, on on a, on a tournament series. And people, I, I've heard some people have a bad impression of him just because he seems like he's um, a little bit uh, aloof or a little bit um, uh, prickly. Just cold. Yeah, a little bit cold. But that's, yeah. but you know, that's, that's sort of, uh, that's not even half the picture. You, 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 you need to see him in his element. You need to see him um, you know, interacting with people in between rounds, uh, it's complete strangers, um, in between rounds. And he's, he's just, I'm just so happy that he won this pro tour. It is it like, it's definitely the a new. long time coming. And I, I, there have been times when, when Jerry has like flown to events to try yeah. to make certain levels or certain, oh, yeah. certain things and certain, and he's, he's not gotten there and he went all that way and spent all that money and all that time. And didn't make it. And that's and, and at different time periods, that's happened to him. And yes, he's won Grand Prix, and he's just yeah. been he's been grinding it. He's a, an there amazing are, player. He's a super cool dude. The other thing is that he's, he's run so far below expectation for how good he is. Like most, like a lot of Magic players, they get lucky, they win their one Pro Tour, then they become a name. Jerry has run so far below expectation to only have as many Pro Tour top eights as he has, to only have as many GP wins as he has. He honestly should be in the conversation of, of you know, greatest minds of the last 10 years, but his, his results don't match up to it. Right. Um, and so having this Pro Tour win puts a nice big stamp on his resume, and I just, I just love it. And if you look deep into his closet, if you Google search him, Jerry has gone on record as saying he loves him some dredge. Oh sure. God. Oh, he yeah, has defended it. Multiple. He has Opens. played it. He has written articles. I have bookmarked Absolutely. them. Absolutely. I Jerry have loves referenced sure them. Oh, that. yeah. Loves it. Yeah. That's amazing. And speaking of, speaking of zombies, yeah, zombies Aaron. were amazing. Yes. Aaron, how, you, how are you feeling about this new zombie uh, apocalypse, if you will? There you go. So uh, I was living, no pun intended. Um, I, I thought it was fantastic. Um, I have been wanting zombies in standard for a long time. Um, it was nice to see different variations of them. You know, Chris Spinell was playing the black-white version yep. uh, with the Binding Mummy, which is very good, and the Wanderer. Um, I really appreciated the specific lists that they had. I had putzed around with it a little bit right when Amonkhet came out. I was using a version that had Plague Belcher, which I found to be really, really clumsy. Um, and it always feels good when people who are better than you come to the same conclusions as you. Like, I didn't like Plague Belcher, but I didn't feel like I was in a position to make that claim. Um, and it was really nice to see all of the mono blacklists running Diagraph Colossus instead of Plague Belcher, um, because the whole point of that deck is you want to swarm the board, and Plague Belcher killing your own things is very counterproductive. Um, Diagraph Colossus, also speaking of Reddit, uh, Diagraph Colossus had mentioned that it's made, Reddit mentioned that Diagraph Colossus is made up of Graph Digger's cages. 
if you look really, really closely, you can see the runes, like the markings on the cages. That's and I great. think that's so awesome. And so Crypt Breaker really busted out. Again, no pun intended this weekend. People saw what an amazing card that is. Diagraph Colossus had its day. Um, Dread, Rond- Dread Wanderer did work. I mean, it's just a fantastic weekend for zombies. And yeah. I really hope that this isn't a flash in the pan and that it is a it becomes a pillar standard. I absolutely yeah. believe it is. And particularly, I mean, I think Crypt Breaker just had one of the most amazing weekends. Yeah. This that's is one card. of those cards that has existed for a while been out since shadows everyone was like yeah yep. that was cute whatever with your little rare one drop and it just it reached that that pinnacle like Card is ridiculous these types well, it had to of compete decks. with grave crawler i mean it was one of yeah. those shoes that, it was one of those decks that people had expectations you know kind of like when pull from tomorrow came out and people were like well it's not sphinx's revelation okay yeah but you have to evaluate on its own and right. you know we were really waiting for that one drop zombie and when crit breaker came out there were people going it's not, it's not Grave Crawler. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. not Grave Crawler, but again, this to me was, and there was a very important moment, I think, on sort of day one where I was watching people play it, and they, and, and I was like, okay, they have three zombies, and one of them is Crit Breaker, whatever. We can, yeah. you know, this the, the player, I think it might have been Jerry, it might have been somebody else, but somebody could swing in for five, you know, mm-hmm. because they're two, 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 and one, one. I was like, okay, great. They're going to swing five, they're going to go to 15, that's going to be the end of it. And then they said go, and I was like, what? What? Yeah, and then <laughs> they their turn. They drew a card, and then they said go. And after they made a zombie, and then and then their turn, they drew another card, and then yeah. they just started running away with the game, like drawing two cards all of a sudden every single turn, two extra cards because mm-hmm. this thing was just going nuts. And that is just that that to me was that like whoa, this deck is doing things that it could not do until it had the right amount of pieces that came in thanks to Almond Cat. Yep. I mean, it does two different things that decks like that want to do. It smooths out your curve, number one. A deck like that really wants to go turn one, you know, Crypt Breaker or, or the Dread Wanderer, turn two, Relentless Dead, turn three, Lord of Cursed. Um, but if you don't have a two drop, Crypt Breaker is your two drop. Like, that's right. fantastic. You can just activate the ability. Um, and second, it gives an aggro deck an ability to refresh their hand and draw cards. Um, aggro decks are sort of famous for, you know, dr- throwing their hand out there and being in top deck mode. Um, you can pivot and, and refuel your hand hand and give you even more options and so it really defies i think in a lot of ways what a traditional aggro deck can do um i think it competes with mardu vehicles in terms of just sheer bodies and power yeah. um and it was just so refreshing to see and i just loved watching it every time I'm there's so a couple uh, there's a couple notes about this mono black zombies deck that i just love first of all 4x dark salvation dark god salvation bless insane. dark salvation card was like insane. what Love in it. the world like i mean i get i get that it's it's put X zombies onto the battlefield, but it's like, this is a crazy card to have as a four of in your oh, yeah. aggro deck. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's this is this is your late game, you know, zombie fireball basically, zombie ball, um, right. which is fantastic. Relentless dead, obviously MVP. I uh, other than Crypt Breaker, um, you know, when you have a deck a, a deck like this that needs to be able to sustain pressure, having a card like Relentless Dead being able to not only stay alive itself but bring other things back is a huge deal. Um, and so, you know, copies of Relentless Dead I think are already just going for infinite. It's a mythic from a from a small set, so it's it's, like it's going to be uh, twenty five dollars. Yeah. yeah, it's that thing's gonna go way through the roof. Um, and the last thing, <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. And the last thing I wanted to say about Mono Black Zombies is, what's the last time a tribal deck won a Pro Tour? I was trying to think about this, and I think it was. I mean, the ones that come to mind are LSV's Elves in Old Extended, okay, and Charles Gindy's Merfolk at Pro Tour Hollywood were the two that I recalled. Uh, he played. He played Elves. He played Black Green Elves. Oh, and he, he played Black Green Elves, not Murphy. Correct. But that uh, was another another tribal deck. Yeah, and that was, uh, I think it was Fairies or something. And, of course, that was even tied yeah. and whatnot, so you would expect it. Uh, I would note that one of the coolest things about this Pro Tour was that uh, there were four copies of Bone Picker in the entire in the entire tournament. Wow. And it made And it made top eight. That's crazy. And that black green aggro that deck. That black green aggro deck. That's four awesome. Four in the whole tournament, and it made top eight. That is so. Oh, sweet. Eldrazi! I'm forgetting about Eldrazi being a tribal deck. Well, there you go. We're, we'll Can we talk that about that new perspectives deck though? It yeah. was so sweet. Oh my god. I am both glad it yes. exists, and please God, don't ever be good. Please don't <laughs> ever, ever be actually good. Oh, I, that is completely up my alley. Like, I remember the first time I saw it, Saffron Olive went 5-0 and oh with it. And I was just assuming that was just one of his hashtag blame Seth things. Like, this is never going to take off. This is just him being him and God bless him. But then all of a sudden I saw it on camera and I was like, oh, no. 
oh no and oh, yeah. and it just looks like so much fun to play and just the whole like cycle 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 and i was like this is i get it i love it this is great <laughs> yeah that was a cool deck the problem is that it has such an atrocious matchup against one of the other big popular decks uh that we'll get to uh, that, that it, it wasn't too uh too powerful it didn't it didn't make top eight which was unfortunate but i think that the fact that it even showed up the fact yeah. that people even brought it is enough for me to be like, yeah, awesome. They made a, they had a sweet combo there. Did yeah. you see the list that Michael Majors was thinking of playing? Did no. you see that? So Michael Majors had tweeted a deck, a BDM asked him about it. I guess it was the deck he wanted to take to the Pro Tour, but the rough edges hadn't been filed down enough. And sure. it's kind of similar to that. It runs like pieces of the puzzle, splendid reclamation, you know, kind of a similar theory of like just getting rid of all your cycle lands and then doing right. splendid reclamation, bring them all back and then have the means to like rush out a world breaker, rush out an Ulamog. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of really obscure blue cards there. And that looks really fun too, if you're into things in that vein. Yeah, nice. I mean, the, the new perspective deck it felt like eggs. Eggs yeah. is, egg, but eggs was too good. Eggs was, you know, uh -huh. oh right. God, eggs was miserable to watch. I have said some terrible things to eggs players, <laughs> and, and I've got actually some really weird feedback of like, you know, eggs actually got a lot of people banned because it's kind of easy to cheat with that deck if people aren't yeah. noticing what you're doing and doing these repetitions and all these cycles and whatever. Like, and when you're cycling forever and picking up cards with, you know. Uh, with other spells, things get yep. a little weird and a little crazy. So I am ecstatic it showed up, and I am all elated that it sucks. So <laughs> <laughs> it, did, it, it didn't do yeah. very well. It you know didn't. What? Fair. Uh, it I, did not do very well. Correct. I mean, I, I ain't making it up, man. It's, it's just how it is. Uh, so, and I would know, and I thought this was really extraordinary. I'm going to bring up a slide here of the ratings for Pro Tour Amonkhet. There yeah. were like 45,000 people watching uh -huh. the finals of Pro Tour Amonkhet. That is an incredible watershed moment. Yeah, that's a huge number. That is a um, monster I, amount. I mean, you you compare the, the, the peak number for Amonkhet to the peak number for previous Pro Tours, and it's not even close. No. Um, you know, it, I, I think that part of that was probably the star power of having Yuya and Jerry in the finals. Part of it was probably having these, you know, s these titans of the game playing two very different decks that were the stories of the Pro Tour. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, this is a huge, this is a huge deal to have, you know, for over forty five thousand viewers at your peak, uh, peak, peak viewership. That's a great a show. Yeah. And every yeah, everything came together. I thought it was really great. I thought Wizards put on a very good show. Now, yes. granted, I think I think we don't we're always wanting to improve, right? We're always wanting to improve. Here we go. First step of improving. Let's take a look at the slides. Yep. <laughs> Maybe we Maybe review make sure. the slides and don't talk about older standard cards. It's not a yeah, huge yeah, deal. Yeah. We're not <sighs> super upset. No, Maybe it's not should, upset. Maybe, it's just Maybe like we want you to be perfect. We want you to be perfect. So we want you to look good. We want magic to look good. We don't want to do things that would be like, well, and that's one of those, you know, it's okay. So that's, that's a little silly bit of what we wanted to throw in there. However... We're going to move on here to another sort of topic that kind of came up as a result of stuff like that, uh, which was, you know, there was there was a lot not a there was a lot of downtime. Okay, I was watching yeah. a lot of the pro I mean, tour. It's a magic tournament. There's it's it's a turn based game. There rat time in between rounds. It's going to happen. Absolutely. So Jeremy Knoll, who uh, who now is starring in Split Second and has made content for a long time, and you know him and I we started SCG Live essentially, and it was great. So he is talking about. You know, uh, a Reddit thread celebrating the PT stream got got forty getting forty k viewers. Yay! He clicked it. Ads are terrible. Oh god! And he closes his window. Uh, right. And Saffron Olive, you know, our, our friend Seth says having something interesting for sub slash Twitch Prime no ad people would be a good way to encourage subscription because for those who you know had subscribed or had Twitch Prime they just saw this static slide or these series of static slides with the same old music with the same old countdown. And if you didn't have Twitch Prime or subscription to the channel, you saw the same ad 37 times. Jesus, I saw the same commercial a million times. It was ridiculous. Yeah. However, it brought up the question, what content would you suggest for subs during ads? And, you know, I think Seth kind of immediately jumped out where there's options, there's interviews, there's deck lists. I know uh, Clarion Community College uh, actually made a video where he had some ideas as well of things that you'd be able to kind of put in there as reasons for you know subscribing like whether it's you know uh, episodic content that you can only see when when you're subscribing or whether it's sort of bits and pieces or whether it's a certain interview or whether it's a certain feature that only you get access to other than just slide after slide commercial yeah. after commercial 
I don't know if it should really be at the top of their priority list, though. No. You know, I feel like whether whether or not it's about sort of making content for subscribers versus trying to cover more matches. You know, I do think one of the things that is really interesting is how uh, CFB kind of piloted the idea of having sort of the rewind match or what do they call it, like the time walk match or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where they're able to kind of play back something and talk about it. And maybe they kind of go the next level of the Pro Tour where they play back a match maybe that has happened or just happened. And maybe they kind of analyze it and they kind of break it down. Maybe they, maybe they kind of go more in-depth into something instead of just like, whoo, round's over, see you guys in ten minutes. You know, it's like, maybe we can kind of back up. Maybe do some instant replays. Maybe do some sort of, you know, sports scenery type stuff. Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, you're fine. I was just going to say, um, you know, Star City Games does that. You know, how many times have we seen the the rewind of the infamous Ross, Miriam, Patrick Sullivan match, you know? Right. Um, they have, you know, a highlight reel uh, ready Absolutely. and rare to go at a moment's notice. Even plugging your own things. You could play Friday Night Lights. I think that's the one with uh, LRR. Yeah. With you could, the, you could air Rams, those sure. episodes in between. That's another way to sort of keep it in-house. Um, you could also be advertising your leagues. I know Randy just launched the new team draft league. Plug that too, you know. Yeah. There's so many other things that you could plug other than just, you know, the same ad 37 times. Yeah, I mean, if I, I for God's sakes, I'm not going to go watch Diary of a Wimpy Kid, okay? But I <laughs> saw that trailer like 800 times. Did you know Alicia yeah. Silverstone is the mom in that movie? Really think about oh, that. God. Alicia Silverstone is getting mom parts in movies. Oh, we are old, guys. Mom. As if. <laughs> wow! Right. So there were a lot of there were a lot of great things about this pro tour. Um, obviously, I mean Maria was fabulous on the news desk. Maria Every was time I tuned and in, adorable. And, and adorable, and, and but but like sharp and and enunciates and you know it, it's very tough to complete sentences for eight hours in a row. It's very very difficult, and she did it. And and I thought that she was. You know, top notch, and I hope that they have her back. Which, by the way, uh, Randy, this was Randy's not pro tour, but a thread came up on Reddit saying that they've missed Randy, Aww. which was very nice. And there's about a hundred comments of of all the good things that Randy does. So all these folks that are retiring from Wizards, all you have to do is retire, and then we'll just give you these beautiful eulogies uh, on Reddit. Um, but <laughs> but they will... you know, there's Go ahead. sorry, there are, there are a number of things that you can do to mitigate the the ad fatigue right sure. the first one is just get more get more varied sponsors right you don't necessarily have to have just two sponsors you can have you know one company and play three of their commercials throughout the entire weekend that's one way to handle it and that's that's typically the way that you avoid fatigue for um you know tv shows and stuff like that when you when you get too used to a commercial when you when you're watching like oh that's that verizon commercial i've seen 85 times um, then that, that's a problem and it makes you change the channel or mute the TV or, or other things that will turn you away from the stream, which is bad enough on television and on the internet it's even worse yeah. um, because then people just don't come back because they're you know off playing Flappy Bird or whatever. Um, <laughs> so, wow, Flappy Bird. I'm that was saying. five-year-old references, Brett. Yeah, man. Um, so, yeah, I'm an old man. We're so. going to get the Dallas folk. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think that there were there were more good things than bad things that happened at this Pro Tour. This is just, you know, we're, we're always poo-pooing all of the things that can be improved. But you know what? Good job, guys. This yeah, was a good it, one. It, it was a good one. It was a good one. Now, one of the funniest moments, as, in, as we begin here, one of the funniest moments was an interview with Martin Muller <laughs> yeah. and BDM. And I can't play it because it's a family-friendly show. But let's just right. say that Martin dropped the F-bomb. Not only twice. once, but twice. Well, and there was an amazing moment where Brian David Marshall has the face. Has the fa let's do let's do the face. It's it's and it's just it's the bug out. He couldn't believe it. It's amazing. It was, it was amazing. And at this point, it's actually his profile picture on Twitter. Yeah, was the it, face. It's been Andy Warhol and everything. And and he posted a a, a tweet about uh, you know this content has been edited for language and formatted to fit this screen with a sensor on top yeah. of Martin's with mouth. The card sensor, yeah. The actual card sensor. That was a wonderful, amazing moment. There was one other moment which we'll get to in just a little bit. Can we talk about Can we talk about Martin growing up a little bit? There was some scruff. There was some buff. It was like, hey, yeah. it was, <laughs> hey man, puberty what? is a hell of a thing. <laughs> He's growing up before our very eyes. Is what uh, he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> before our very, very eyes. 
And there was this great, and, and, and some people kind of mentioned this in the thread that was talking about it. You know, Martin Muller had this amazing, like, make a wish thing that happened in September yes. 2016. That, if I recall, we actually talked about this. Yes, uh, we did. Yeah, and it was, it was, it's, it's so cool to kind of go back and look at that, where again, he was just like the young, you know, Lord of this young strapping man, and then now he's just like getting all yeah. gruff and all buff and just kicking butt and own. cursing on screen. He held his own very well. I have to say, one of the most entertaining matches I watched this weekend was the one against with him and Huey. Um, I think it was around 13 or 14. It was one of the later rounds. They were playing yeah. for like top eight um, contention, and that matchup was fantastic. I enjoyed. It. I feel like he held up really well. Huey had some amazing plays that he pulled out of nowhere. I think he was down to like five cards in his deck. Um, Liliana Dust Majesty did a lot of work. That was a really good match. If you get a chance, you should go back and watch that. Absolutely. So yeah. you know, he's 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 growing up. <laughs> We're up and, he's he's all grown up and saving China and dropping f bombs, all that stuff. <laughs> it's incredible. But all right, so another thing that came up this week was something called a play design group. This actually came up this this morning. Uh, Mark right. Rosewater announced on the Tumblr blog a talk. I'm not going to read the whole bit, but one of the, you should make Ruben read it. I know, right? Oh God. Okay, hold on. Ruben. I got to click on it. Ruben. <clears throat> me, me, me. Uh, me, 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 me. Simple wits. Simple wits. All right, I'm ready to go. Several weeks ago, <laughs> I said that we were taking steps to improve the processes behind the scenes in R&D to ensure that we don't repeat some of our mistakes from last year. I'm happy today, to t every day really, to talk about one of these changes, the creation of a new group within R&D called Play design. <laughs> the purpose of play design is to be a group solely dedicated to the health of tournament environments to make sure that playing magic in structured settings is as enjoyable as possible. This will, of course, impact the quality of these formats, even for players playing outside of tournaments. We recently hired Dan Burdick great guy, by the way. You guys should all go uh, follow him on, on Twitter. He's hilarious. We recently hired Dan Burdick to run this team and are currently staffing it up. This has included moving current R&D members onto the team, as well as converting two of our playtesters, welcome Pro Tour Top Aiders, Melissa DeTora and Andrew Brown, into full-time employees. We're also looking for additional experienced players outside of Wizards to bring into the team. My face really hurts, but I feel like that. <laughs> Besides having a team solely focused on this task, we're also changing how we build sets from the ground up to make sure that play design is involved at every step. Design, for example, will be working with play design to make sure we're creating mechanics that can be properly balanced. Dan is just setting in, but he'll be writing an article appearing in June, I believe. That's time for the Drive to Work podcast <laughs> that will formally introduce the team and explain its form. You know what that oh means. God. You know what that means. It's time for the play design group. <laughs> oh, oh massage God. the face. Is, massage uh, the face. That is. Uh, oh, my God. All right. I'm not so. The rest of the episode. That was too uh, much. Well, ultimately, <laughs> it's a new group. All right. So, look, I'll be honest. I don't really understand what this means I, I i've i've been thinking about it we've talked about it i've i've mentioned it online i feel like it's an odd kind of title for the group i i don't know like, look i'm looking forward to the article where dan kind of explains sort of what their role is because at this point it's just like yeah they want they're dedicated to the health of tournament environments what does that mean i thought like wizards works a year in advance so does that mean they're playing standard with the next set they're trying is this just sort of like another sort of Dev group right. because they already have a development team. They so is this? They have research and they have development, and this right. is sort of they're turning it into R and D and D, which you can't R and D and D because when you are in D and D, <laughs> they already have D and D. Wow. But it, it is a really weird. I guess this would be R and P and D because it's play design. But in any case, they'll work on the on that later. This is a, a weird step but a necessary step. I mean, they've had enough design mistakes or you know, designer development mistakes over the past couple of years that they're like, look, we don't want to keep banning cards from standard. So what can we do to solve this? Well, none of us are really pro players or 
not enough of us are really pro players. And so what they can do is now you have R&D and, and then you have this whole kind of separated group. I hope they keep it completely separated where they're just like, here's the spoiler, build decks. And then they do that once every two weeks. And then they do that until the set isn't busted, that it's a playable format. Um, you know, they, they get the pro players to break it just like you hire hackers to try to hack into your website um, and then, you know, they find the leaks in your website and then you can fix those things. That's exactly what they're trying to do here. Um, and so, you know, I think that this is a necessary step. It is a little weird, um, but I think that it's it's ultimately a, a, a good step forward. I, if um, One of the things they've always kept sort of talking about was... Uh, development is focused on limited. Development needs to make sure the limited environment is good. The limited environment is great. We're not banning cards from limited because that's insane. But if this is kind of the constructed counterpart, if this is the your job is to find the Felidar Guardians of the set, I, I, that's a good that's a good thing. I don't know yeah. how they get involved. And I will I will quote here at this point. Uh, uh, des design, for example, will be working with play design to make sure that we are creating mechanics that can be properly balanced. What in the world does that mean? Literally, what does that even mean? That can be properly balanced. You make a mechanic, it does a thing? Right. Well, I mean, what? there have been mechanics in the past that were not Delve. properly balanced. <laughs> like Delve. Anything that reduces cost is bad, right? So Delve, Phyrexian Mana, Dredge, Dredge. these all are, are things that... that, that make mana costs less relevant, right? So you need to be able to properly uh, balance those kind of <laughs> effects from professional players and get their input. And if you still want to put them out, sure, by all means. But you need to be able to have a pro player's opinion and not just a game designer's opinion. I, I feel like you could have a little flow chart, you know, and it says, does this mechanic reduce cost? Get rid of it. It just, right. your, and that's where you go. And then right. it goes well, away. Well, Henny's expertise hasn't really blown up like we thought it would. All the expertise is, well, so also, those, are, those are reasonable. But. Right. First of all, I'm glad that they didn't bring anything because Lord knows they're, they're dangerous. However, uh, that's also one card, right? A cycle of cards. Right. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, Aaron, are you okay with them killing the future dredges of the world? <laughs> I still believe that it's coming back in Hour of Devastation. I, I choose what? to believe. I think a fixed that's dredge. The, I think it's fine to that do That is the reason why, version. that is my tinfoil hat theory as to why the Aftermath cards are so bad. Because they knew dredge was coming back in Hour and they didn't want to give us too many goodies. So It's going to be Mummify. I've already mm -hmm. told you about this idea, right? Ruben, I mean, you get me. Yeah, well, yeah. they have Embalm which turned every creature into a call of the herd. Uh, and um, it's okay. Which is good, like it's a fine, it's a fine ability, but it's not seeing any standard play. It's actually really not very popular in draft either. No. Um, yeah, if you were watching the Team Super Draft coverage last night, uh, Justin Cohen broke down that it turns out that the Blue White Embalm deck was actually one of the stronger decks solely because no one wanted to be in that deck. So you got all of the cards. I mean, I and appreciate so, that they're, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. No, I was just going to say, I appreciate, you know, kind of like Ruben said, that they're at least acknowledging, you know, the mistakes that have been made. You know, it'd be really easy for them to say, well, what do you want? We gave you bannings, you know, and take nothing away from the experience. We kind of talked about this, I think, a couple of shows ago about how, you know, I think we talked about this in relation to Modern Masters, where it's really great that you're tapping into Modern Masters and getting, you know, these great sales and all of this money. But if you're not taking steps to fix the actual problem, which might be that your sets aren't very good, that your sales from your standard sets are declining then what are you really accomplishing? And so, you know, it does sound like they're listening to feedback. It does sound like they're trying. Um, and I think that, that that's a good thing. And so I don't know if this is going to be the answer per se, but I think they definitely have good people at the helm, Melissa Dottora, hey. Um, and they're trying. And and I, I hope that this also, you know, maybe maybe older formats maybe get considered too. Um, you know, I'd like, I'd like to think that that's a thing where they're going, is this something maybe, you know, like the vizier, that vizier with the minus one, minus one, that now we got to deal with devoted yeah. druids everywhere like you could have run her through this cycle so we don't have to deal with that but um right. yeah i'm anxious to see what comes of this i think it's going to be good nice well any any amount of like you know high level thinking and play thrown at a set in some fashion definitely feels like better than not throwing said high level play at yeah. the set. so i i will i will definitely take that one um so let's keep moving on here to going infinite going Infinite is where we talk about something that may not necessarily be anything but an exercise uh you know in uh in pontification but this and in this case schadenfreude 
the, the Schaden of the Freudist. Well, really? Well, what we're looking at here is uh, Rivals of Ixalan. Now, RivalsofIxalan.com, along with the Rivals of Ixalan trademark, were, were officially entered by Wizards of the Coast. And probably the name of the uh, of the expansion like I mean like there's yep. Ixalan and then Rivals of Ixalan right. is the and next Rivals set of Ixalan. Yep. which makes sense there so that's kind of neat we've never really had rivals right we've had gods like we did Namaket right. rivals is a thing maybe sure alright da 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 yeah it makes Moving sense on. Well, the far more interesting one which is I think which I have it up here on the screen is 25 they trademarked 25 they trademarked a logo of yeah. a planeswalker symbol and 25 With the number in it. 25 in it. Yeah, the number 25. And now next year is the 25th anniversary of Magic. There have been a non-zero amount of rumblings about a core set coming back. Right. Because without core sets, it's difficult to put cards that I think many people feel are needed or necessary. You know, your doom blades, your murders, your 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 pithy needles, whatever. Yeah. Like cards that don't necessarily just drop in every set like you like them to. And this gives them the ability to do so. However, this fall, there's going to be Iconic Masters, which is going to show up at Hascon. Yeah. So, Iconic Masters is a thing, but 25 is a thing? This is why I said Schadenfreude, because we were just making fun of these supplementary sets, of being like, do what you're doing with your good standard sets, and then this won't be a problem. Meanwhile, we've just got every Masters expansion possible coming out right. over the next six months or whatever. I mean, this is a cool logo. Okay. Like what? What you know? But you got to fix the main problem. This is you can't put a second story on a house with a shaky foundation. So, you know, if this is a standard set, then cool, I guess. Then they're bringing back core sets. You really think that that's what twenty five is? I think it made me they... think of Adele. I was like, can we have like a thirty set and like a twenty eight set? And like that's where I was going with this. Nice, nice. <laughs> well, it's I don't know about you, but three years ago, all right, that's enough of that. <laughs> I, I know that essentially. I, well, first of all, again, we've seen rumblings of, like, what would you call the core set if they're popular with the core set, right? That was one of the, right. these survey questions. Uh, another was, you know, like, here's this thing. It's a 25th anniversary. If I were going to reboot the core set sort of cycle and series and whatnot, this sure. is not a bad way to go. Another option that some people are saying is maybe this is, like, a from the vault type of product. And it's a special thing that has special foils or whatever. Let me assure you what it's not. It's not going to kill the reserve list. Yeah. I swear. None of it will. Never, ever. We're never going to get a two white, one generic mana, two, two flying first strike. That Thunder Spirit will live on forever in infamy. That's it. That's the yep. end. We'll never get it. Let it go. It's okay. Yep. So 25 yeah, well, I mean, is we, coming, and that's really interesting. We, yeah, we have no information to go on, really, other than it's within the Planeswalker symbol, so it's a generic product as opposed to a, a plane specific product um you know it might be planeswalker themed or whatever uh but yeah we have no information to go on other than the set symbol so it's interesting that they that they uh um uh got this trademark in at the same time as a presumed set name right. um because usually they only they do set names together and then they do other stuff together uh, when, whenever they uh, buy up all of the, the intellectual properties. So 25 is going to be a set name, I'm pretty sure. Um, maybe maybe just so. the I, number 25, which I, is kind of interesting. I'm definitely excited with whatever they want to do for the 25th anniversary. I am so jazzed that they're going to do something. Yes. They did nothing for the 20th anniversary. Like, they did, what, 20 years and 20 minutes or something with Marrow? Right. And that's, that's kind it. of sort of it, okay? All yeah, right. I mean, to have a game that's been around for 25 years, is that's a big deal. So hopefully they do something. All right, so let's move on here to Desperate Ravings. Now, this this past weekend, of course, Pro Toromaket, really cool. I'll be honest, I'm the, the team thing is sweet, okay? Yeah, It was I sweet the when thing. they came up with it. It's still sweet now. I think it's great. I think some people need to work on their team names. Sure. Mm, there's, there's some out there where you're like, really? That's what you want? Yeah. All right. However... We're in this weird, we're in this weird transitionary period of like, the teams aren't all qualified. So, right. did you really have Shaheen Sarani have to call in via Skype on the cell phone Girl. to explain about the testing process? Aaron, uh. Aaron, tell us a little bit about what was going on with the teams. 
So, you know, like you said, they've really been pushing this team narrative. And I think there are times where it works and there are times when it doesn't. And when it really doesn't work is when the teams aren't there. Um, we talked about it last week. One of my draft picks was Lucas Esper. He was the only young man on, an, on a team of like six or seven that qualified for this thing. Uh, the group photos, you know, one of the things that you got to see in between rounds was these pictures of all of the teams. And you would see this group of, of happy guys wearing their teams t-shirts or their jerseys you would see their names on the side and there were these really pesky asterisks and the asterisk represents the fact that they're not there and so you see this happy group of guys you assume that they're all there and two of them are there right. um which really compounds you know the whole point of it you know we're supposed to be rooting for teams we're supposed to be really leaning on that um and more importantly you know one of the good moments i think that that really reminded us you know how the teams are working is christian calcano uh when he found out that he made top eight he cried he burst yep. into tears on camera i cried with him yeah. um and what made that moment so great was that he thanked his team his team was all around him they were sad and happy too um, yep. they all hugged him he cried in their arms I think that you know the fact that people didn't qualify kind of took away from the team thing but seeing a moment like that really brought it back to why we're doing the team thing and that was right up there with the Martin Muller thing being one of the moments of the pro tour was seeing him qualify and you know I know that a lot of people were rooting for Jerry and rightfully so but I don't know anybody that wasn't touched after that Calcana moment because of he course. was so happy to be there and so grateful and it was beautiful yeah calcano epitomizes the put in work type of magic player you know yeah. you, like not not everyone is johnny and magic right yeah. not everyone is born i need the sensor right on top not everybody is born uh you know coming out of the womb as john finkel and can do everything naturally and not have to practice as hard as most other people. Christian Calcano has put more into this game uh, for a person who has not top eight at a pro tour. He's put more energy. He's like, you know, gone into personal debt at various times in his life. He's, he's, he, and he's just like created this, he's just engendered this feeling of family. Like there wasn't anyone in all of social media that I could tell that was like, oh, this that 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 ass Christian Calcano, I don't like him at all. Too bad he top aided. Like everyone came out and was, you know, this was while the thankful react was available on Facebook also. So everyone <laughs> Bring was it back. Like, so everybody was just purple flowers all over the place about Christian Calcano making this Pro Tour top eight for the first time. And it was just a beautiful showing of community. And I want that clip to be what people look at. I want if you if people are like, why do you care about this card game? Show them that clip this person worked hard for years unable to make a pro tour top eight unable to make a pro tour top eight winning gps yeah. uh designing decks for other people that have pro tour top aided uh innovating limited formats putting together research and and information for his team and he finally got it and it's just it's it's just so cathartic to watch him you know, break down into tears um, for finally I, achieving that mountaintop. I put the uh, I put the link in the description. Or not the, well, a I put the link in the description in terms of the podcast. If you're looking at that or the video, uh, I put the link in the chat so you guys can check that out. Um, it's definitely one of those moments that I, I don't know. I, I hope that it kind of gets close to the sort of lightning helix moment of like why the pro tour sure. is important, why teams are important. But again, if half of his team wasn't there. I feel you would have had a little bit of a less moment. Clearly, it yeah. still would have, would have made an impact, and it was emotional, and it's amazing. And I've known Christian for a long time. Guy's absolutely fantastic. Works his butt off. My God, that boy has road warriored like few have road oh, warriored yeah. for yeah. real. It's just it's ridiculous. So, I think there needs to, be, to become like a consensus here about this team thing, okay? You kind of need all the team members, or you kind of start not caring as much. Sure, it's not Wizards' fault that these guys didn't, you know, that, that teams entered and then they fell off, you know, the wagon. Like, sure. that's not their fault that they entered. That, it's not their fault that Lucas Esperberto won the Pro Tour and then the rest of his team didn't qualify for the next Pro Tour. That's not Wizards' fault. Well, so, no, the problem is, in terms but, of the setup, when you have, a, I'm sorry, I'll just two seconds. When you have, like, esports, for example, and they are team based, Sure. Even if some of them have have singleton sort of you know uh, championships, whether it's like singleton Starcraft and there's team Starcraft stuff, but you know like you don't necessarily just say, well, you have to go back and requalify in order for you to play in this team event. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think the other thing that, you know, Ruben, you brought up, which I think was really great, was you mentioned the word family. And I feel like another another thing we need to work on if we're going to keep stressing this team format is teams that actually really are friends and really do care about each other. You know, I feel like what made that moment so much more special was the fact that his team cared about him. And he yep. even said that I wouldn't be here with these people. I feel like there are some teams where they were breathing. They're good sure. players. They have each other's phone numbers and they formed a team. And that's not to say that that doesn't work. Sure. But in terms of rooting for people, in terms of entertainment value, you know, when you see Peach Garden Oath and you see the emotion when one of them does well and Reed and Owen hug Huey or whatever, that's what people want to see. And I feel like that shines through so much more than just the teams of, well, they're the best players in my county, so we formed a team. I feel like there sure. needs to be more of an emphasis on building that friendship, building those bonds, really, really fleshing out what it means to be a team and not just being machines, not just being whoever was conscious on Twitter. I feel like that needs to be something that we focus on too, of really fleshing out what it means to be part of a team. I, I think ultimately my, my concern is, I think it takes away from the team aspect when all the team is not there. Yeah. I, and I don't, I mean, no matter what sort of team thing that you're doing in terms of esports or gaming, when when a, ch when a chunk of your team is missing, and, when it, and because a chunk of your team is missing, you're not able to do as well in terms of the rankings and so on and so forth, that kind of that's going to snowball as the years go as the year goes on as this team thing goes on and i want all the team members to be there i mean i don't know yeah. what threshold you need to cross i don't know what, what form you need to sign but if there was a way that the teams could be there always that's a thing i'm just i'm just saying it yeah it means you can't more fix when that, everybody's though. there it means more when everybody's there that's all i'm saying yeah. Well, well, we are seeing more of a move towards. I mean, look at how hot team constructed is right now. You know, you're seeing SCG at Louisville's this weekend. You know, this was not supposed to be a team constructed event. You know, I right. mean, maybe we are moving to a point where, you know, this is a long shot and probably isn't going to happen. But you know, we do seem to be moving to a point where people love the team events and and people not only love playing them but they the attendance is good and you know maybe we'll reach a point you know in the in the future the not so distant future where it isn't just a single player game anymore where it does come down to teams whether it be teams of three teams of you know packs of six or whatever maybe we're eventually moving to a point where Magic isn't a, a one on one game anymore. So what we did last week was a little bit of a draft. You know, we took some players, we took some teams. <laughs> Rubes, would you give us the rundown of kind of what happened? Absolutely. And I'll, right, I'll paste so the link once we're done here. So Aaron's team of LEB, uh, Lion's Eye Biamond, of uh, Lucas, <laughs> Lucas Esper Berthold, the defending champion, plus Yelger Vigersma and hashtag, everybody in the chat now. Hashtag Baywatch, read Duke. Hashtag Baywatch. Um, were her three individual players as well as Team Conflagrease. Uh, unfortunately, Hashtag my big fat Greek pro tour. My big fat Greek pro tour, there you go. Uh, her team of, uh, of singleton players, uh, Lucas only got nine points, but Yelger and Reed put together 21 and 33 point performances. Reed losing a win and in uh, to get into the top eight, uh, sadly, of course. Um, for a grand total of 63 points in individual play. Ooh. Evan had Kentaro Yamamoto, Brad Nelson, and Paulo Vitor Dance Dance Revolution as his singleton players. They had 27, 33 for Brad, and 27 for PV. So he had 87 going into the oh. team portion of our draft. Uh, and my team of John Finkel, Martin Juza, and John Stern Unfortunately, Johnny Magic only put up nine points on the board this Pro Tour. So Yelger and uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Lucas and, and Johnny <coughs> to uh, the only that didn't make day two. Martin Juza put together 30 points and John Stern had 27 for my grand total of 66. So moving on to the team portion, Evan is in the lead with 87 to 66 to 63. Now we get to the teams. My big fat Greek Pro Tour, Conflagris, entered the tournament in ninth only could put together 13 team points. Aww. They they had 36 at the previous Ooh, Pro Tour. Papadopoulos. Only, yeah, Papadopoulos. They're still not my really, heroes. Not rocking this Metropolis. So the 13 points added to the 63 gives her a grand total of 76. Uh, entering the round, I was in uh, second place, and uh, I chose Team Musashi, who had, was in second place overall, uh, in the team standings, um, and 
They had 49 points from Pro Tour at the Revolt. Wow. And then got 70. 70! Pro Tour. 7-0. Yeah. I think they put two people in the top eight and then another one in the top 16. I don't. I didn't look at the statistics, but it was absurd. They, they crushed this Pro Tour. So that gives me a grand total of 136, which was too much of an edge for Evan to match, to, uh, to match up with his team puzzle quest. 37 points, still quite good. They had 36 at the last Pro Tour, 37, so a little bit of an improvement, but 124 final. So bronze medal, Aaron, 76 points. Silver medal, Evan, 124. And still, <laughs> your reigning champion of the Magic wow. Bikes Fantasy Draft with 136 points. Ruben Bressler. 70 you, points is ridiculous. I, that 70 is a lot of points. That's ridiculous. 70 is an unheard of number of points. That is silly. Yeah, way, to, well way to go, buddy. You, you picked You picked well. So, I, well, I picked Musashi. We I, to be fair, I had the third pick of teams. So you guys could have had this one. I mean, I think it's fitting that we give you something that you won because you're about to lose. Oh. Oh, you think so? Oh, I, I know we so. are going into the red it's, zone, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, my it's God. Been it's been a while, while since I got in a good old-fashioned yeah. fight. But <laughs> I'm on a win streak. As so hold my card again. <laughs> as some may say, it's been a minute. All right? Take this, oh, take this, oh we're, we're staying oh, card again. Hello. Here, here's, here's the red zone, ladies and gentlemen. Is Marvel, is Aetherworks Marvel, Aetherworks Marvel, if you will, is it a design mistake? Uh, Ruben, go ahead and, and tell us how you're wrong. <laughs> Put on your phone now. Press A for yes, it's a design mistake. There's no other option. You have to vote for it is a design mistake. It's a horrifically bad oversight. It makes watching oversight? the Pro Tour coverage bad. Yes, this was designed as a casual card. You can tell it was designed as a casual card because it's got so many words on it. Right? When when you, 90% of the time when you put a card that just is like a weird enchantment or a weird artifact that has no room for flavor text, it's always like, you know, this is doubling season or like, or, you know, lightning, lightning coils or some other casual card. This card was designed for casual play, for EDH, for, you know, um, sitting kitchen table magic. This card should not have been as powerful as it was. Unfortunately, it was printed uh, in a set where Eldrazi existed. Um, Etherworks Marvel itself is the reason that Emrakul was banned. Your flagship card from Eldritch Moon. That's a problem. You want your flagship cards from your flagship sets to be playable. Where, where, wasn't Green Black Delirium the reason that Emrakul was banned? Uh, yeah, I, assume I mean, they were both Delirium reasons. I mean, they both helped, but they I mean, Emrakul might, Emrakul might have been uh, might maybe, maybe still have been banned had Etherworks Marvel cost five or six. But the problem is that it doesn't, and now we're putting Ulamogs into play on turn four. Um, it's it's the the main argument behind Marvel being a mistake is that it's horrendous to watch, it's horrendous to play against, and it just makes it the, a game of magic, a slot machine. Um, you know, there was a, a cardboard crack recently that had an awkward first panel, but that we'll skip, which was basically, it's like trying to flip coins to see if you'll win a game. There's no other, there's nothing else happening. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's hard to interact with. It's not fun to play against. It's difficult to metagame for, and it's, it's bad for coverage. Um, and it makes, you know, losing to Marvel feels bad. Losing to zombies, you're like, all right, fine. I lost to zombies. Losing to black green aggro, all right, fine. Losing to control, even. Losing to, you know, uh, uh, dredge, even. Feels like, all right, I see the machine working. But Etherworks Marvel, in particular, is not a good design for a magic card. It's boring, it's bad to watch, and it's, it's, it's bad to play. All right, so you're totally wrong. And <laughs> here's how. Etherworks Marvel, first of all, uh, Magic the Gathering is a subsidiary of Hasbro, and they need to sell Magic the Gathering packs. They need to sell packs of these cards, okay? This is a mythic. This was one of, if not the first mythic of the set that was that was shown to the world. It featured a brand new type of resource that Magic had never had. If this right. card sucks, the set is going to be underwhelming. This card needed to be exciting. 
this car needed to make sure that you could make it happen. From what I understand, it was one of the reasons it was previewed first. One of the reasons it works the way it does is because it helps sort of Johnny's go, how do I win? What can I do with this? There's a reason it does this cast instead of put on the battlefield. You want this card to, they want it to be one of the flagship cards of the set. This is one of the set, it was one of the cards that's going to define the set. And I 1000% believe this card is not bad for coverage. Are you kidding me? They did an entire mechanic called Miracle, which made amazing coverage moments. And you could argue the same thing, which was like, it's totally random. And oh my God, they drew the, you know, retreat the angels and now they won the pro tour and whatever. So you have a card that yes, creates, here's, here's one of the issues that I would note is that it can create similar play patterns but what it can also create is huge tense moments i certainly dislike the fact that there are such good creatures and whether ember cooler is banned or not i i hate the fact that there were eldrazi with this card because yeah. if it weren't for the eldrazi i honestly think you're just going to get like a really good what gear hulk okay or like yeah or, or glory whatever like a cool dragon so you're able to spin this see if there's something there I think it's really cool when you don't hit something amazing and you have to just rogue refiner it out and just kind of grind it out and win games that way. People take away your Ulamogs, you still have to win some way. And, and of course, because you use a master, he still can. You know, there's the ability to take this card and not only make it one of the highlights, one of the one of the key interactions you want to happen in your deck, but also supplement whatever other strategy you're trying to do. So, yes. Eldrazi make this, makes this card kind of dumb, and I hate that. But I do appreciate the fact that, A, it kicked off energy in a really exciting way. It kicked off the set, I thought, in an exciting way. Uh, B, it's a different way to play magic, sort of use a different resource to try to get a different type of trigger. It makes you build your deck in a different way. And it's a chase rare that people get really excited about to play with, to build decks around. And yeah, if the pros are going to find this the most powerful interaction they can do in standard, they're going to use it the most powerful interaction in standard. There yeah, I have a couple. I have a couple of thoughts on this too. You know, Ruben, you mentioned the fact that playing with Marvel basically equates to being a coin flip, and you would. You say that like Magic itself isn't a coin flip or isn't a game of variance. How many times have you been flooded? How many times Care, have careful you been? Careful now. Uh oh. What? Careful now. With <laughs> your, with your, with your, just saying that Magic the Gathering isn't a skill game. You I, I didn't say it wasn't entirely a skill You game. were heading twice. You were heading I in that direction. I not. But I'm saying that you, you know... Th I will abide is... many things. I will <laughs> let Evan besmir besmirch my name. I will let him spout off nonsense about, you could argue that, whatever <laughs> crap. It could be argued by someone who is me and no one else on the planet. I will let him go off on his nonsense, but you tell me, you apologize for telling Magic that it's not that it's a coin flip. I sure won't. Um, <laughs> and you can at me. That's fine. Um, but no, I think that we we acknowledge that. We acknowledge that Flood is a thing. We acknowledge that Mana Screw is a thing. We acknowledge anybody who plays, who plays a combo deck. You know, if you serum visions and try to dig your way into your combo, sometimes you don't find it. You know, sometimes your opponent top decks the sideboard card that they brought in against you. And that is something that we all accept as being a part of this game. So I find it fascinating that one of the the criticisms that Marvel receives is is the variance aspect, is the coin flip aspect, because there are so many parts of this game. And I think part of the reason we why we love this game is because of that, because we don't know what we're going to draw. It feels great when we're on the receiving end of it, and it feels terrible when we're not. And I feel like that is a bias that oftentimes comes into this argument. Um, the other thing I, I want to talk about is I feel like we've had conversations about what standards should be and what we consider to be a healthy format. And I'm a huge proponent. I think that combos should be part of the healthy format. I think if this was happening in modern or if this was happening in legacy or goth or Redeem of vintage, nobody would be batting an eye but for the longest time we have kept combo out of standard so people who play standard frequently are used to there being just combo aggro and mid-range and i feel like if we had let combo in sooner if we had maybe built up like a tolerance for it or an endurance for it we wouldn't be so surprised are upset when it happens in standard. I think combo is fine. I think that is the sign of a healthy metagame, but we haven't had it for so long that for people who haven't had to deal with it, it does look oppressive. It does look to be more of a coin flip. Um, I think that going forward, if we continue to have combo be a thing, and God forbid that combo takes off or you don't provide answers to it, maybe it won't be so jarring when it does well. But when you haven't had it for so long, of course it's gonna look oppressive because you've never right. had to put up with it. I love combo. You know me. me. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge combo fan. I love yeah. new perspectives. We just talked about that. 
Yeah. I love, um, you know, you like I, I love Guardian? painter. I love did, painter did like servant. That? Right. The problem is when you have oppressive combo. Combo should lead you to winning games and not do them by themselves. You need to be sure. able to build. You need to, you know, you need to be able to build to the ad nauseum. You need to be able to build to the big dredge. You need to be able to build to, you know, whatever it is you're doing. The problem with Aetherworks Marvel is, look, I, I get that combo has been gone for a while. I get that you need to have a splashy rare to be able to sell your sets. That's fine. I get that. Wow. <laughs> Go on. But you're wrong and I hate you. Of course you do. Because, you know... All right. When so... you have a card that lets you look... First of all, we very recently had a card that looked at your top six and put stuff on the battlefield. Hashtag collects the company. That was bad. This is tooth and nail for less than half of the mana. Right? This is this is a big... This, this is a huge skip. The thing that made tooth and nail fair was that it cost nine. The thing that made Dragonstorm fair that it was it cost a billion mana. Same with Enduring Ideal. When you have one card combo, you have to have that one card... Be, can, can be a huge payoff, but it has to be a lot of mana to be able to get you there. And so that's my big problem with Marvel, is that I think it'd be fine at five, maybe six, um, you know, something like that. But I, I also hate when Wizards of the Coast is like, here, play this deck, and then just like shove it in my face of like, here's this Marvel, this is how you do it. And then, and, and that makes me upset um, when they try to do that. And the last thing I will say is uh, a coin flip it is not variance. Variance is what you're describing when you talk about mana screw and mana flood. Sure. Um, there are ways to mitigate variance in different types of decks. A coin flip, there's no way to mitigate a coin flip. Um, and so it, it, the, the type of randomness that you're describing is not the same type of randomness as, for example, a Marvel mirror. Literally feels like a coin flip. Like whoever wins the dice roll and is luckier that's different than being able to mitigate mana, mitigate mana flood, mitigate all of these other variables. So, while I am not advocating for the banning of Etherworks Marvel, because I think that there are ways to play into it, play around it, um, and also it'll be gone to this Ulamog thing anyway. Uh, the biggest problem, of course, is just that you know you have these giant things to put in play that are all on. Yes. You've. Your, your internet has turned to a potato. You know, it would not be a Magic yeah. Mike's broadcast at this point <laughs> if your internet doesn't go potato somewhere sure. in it. And it waited yeah. to right here. I am so, I'm surprised it didn't do it during my Mark Water segment. So I'm thankful for that. that. Yeah, it got all the way through. We have potatoed, hashtag potato alert. In any case, um, Marvel doesn't need to be banned. Just wait for the Eldrazi to leave. I just think that it's a boring card. I, I understand how it can be a one-card combo. I think there is definitely luck and skill and magic. I love the fact that I can explain, even to my daughters, I can say, on your very first game of magic, you could be the number one ranked player in the world. That is a thing that could happen. They could get screwed, you could get all you could hit all your, your drops, and you could win the game. Yeah, that is random, that is sure. variance, but it's a it's a part that's great about magic. And let's not even go to the point of like the first thing everyone tries to do is take mana flood and mana screw away from their game because you know clearly that's what magic needs is is lack of that. Either sure. way, we I want to cover this next thing really quickly for splash <laughs> damage because it's just so silly. Ludicrous. It, Hearthstone qualifiers are taking place in Buffalo Wild Wings. The Hearthstone playoffs will be held in Where Buffalo Wild Wings. Where is Corbin Hostler? Yeah, and, exactly. <laughs> and wow, they were, and so apparently there's some the, some Hearthstone pros who are just really upset at what's going on here, and how dare they have to go and soil their soul with delicious wings and loud, obnoxiously well, loud sports. Right, obnoxiously loud sports is the is the real uh, the real point here of, of you know when you play in a large Hearthstone tournament they put you in like a like a soundproof room with headphones on and they're having you have to you know compete with a loud family of five watching the Utah State game like that's not that's not what you want to have in your your big tournaments these are for the spring championships by the way which there are twenty five or twenty eight of. Um, in 10 venues, and half of those venues are B-dubs, which is absurd. B-B-dub-dubs. Dubs. Yeah. Yeah, so, some of the reasons are hilarious. Like, they were like, you know, there was this one guy who made an account on Reddit, and he was like, the wait staff would not stop coming by my table. 
and the shoddy internet led to multiple disconnections and it's sure. just, oh girl like <laughs> it's it's yeah. a lot of first world problems that's bless that, that's, your heart that's ultimately the issue is they're just like you know i, I get to i want to play this game yeah you want to play it seriously it's in a wiffle wild wings bring some headphones like i don't i don't understand <laughs> If that's the problem, or, I mean, the, the shoddy internet is bad. Like, obviously, sure. that's a bad thing. But oh, I do. I I also agree that they're overreacting a little bit. I mean, if you want to compete in the spring playoffs, you might have to go to a bar that smells like barbecue sauce, Shut which is a ta- which is a tavern, and you play Hearthstone in a tavern. That's wow. the whole theme of the game. So, and I you think know. we can attest to we've played now we've played you know PTQs or IQs in some pretty grimy places before. So, oh, you know, I think yeah. some people would consider Buffalo Wild Wings an improvement. Where <laughs> I have finished more than one tournament at a Crystal's, at a Waffle yep. House, at a Denny's. <laughs> we used to finish Multiple. ours at the TJ's Country Place that was down the wow. street from our local game store. I've heard a story from Alex Hain that he played the finals of a PTQ on the roof of a car in the parking lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> hardcore. So Owen Turtenwald. Owen Turtenwald won his seat for the Sunday Super <laughs> Series either three or two years ago. The finals was held in the lobby of a Holiday Inn. Jesus. Um, yeah, so, you know, when the tournament shuts down, that's a problem. But the problem is that these are going to be starting at, like, noon, right? So the, the, this is not the last-case scenario restaurant. It's just – it is a little funny. It's um, silly. And hopefully right. they're getting enough money from B-dubs to be able to, to get all this flag. Yeah, I mean, this is clearly a marketing endeavor both for Buffalo Wild Wings and for Blizzard. Blizzard wants to say show, like, look, they're playing Hearthstone at B-dubs, and people get all excited about it. And, and ultimately, it's more than Magic is doing. Well, we're kind of I mean, getting there. Like, we, we were in Minecraft all of a sudden. We're in Minecraft true. now. That's a thing. Yeah, I'm Minecraft. telling you that's a big deal. <laughs> As a guy who has kids, that's a big deal. That said, it's finisher time. We're going to turn the corner to the finisher. Now, the first thing I want to do here is I want to announce our winner. We have successfully chosen a winner of the copy of Dungeons & Dragons Tales from the Yawning Portal, 5th edition, is Jay Hernandez, who is in Mexico City, Mexico. Wow. So we're going to be shipping him a super sweet sweet D&D book. Exactly. It's a uh, it's an English version of the book, but it, it's, it is uh, in English. But quite I'm, good. And I also have a winner of my water bottle, which is uh, our buddy uh, MTG Packfoils uh, correctly identified my map on my wall, which nice. is the Twilight Grove of the Grove level of the Sunless okay, Citadel. Nice. And the wow. Sunless Citadel is the first of the of the campaigns that you can you can grab from Tales from the Awning Portal. I it's will give really you. Good. I will also give him plus ten nerd cred points. Nice. Well done. Plus ten. Well, you got you can use those at any Evan Irwin uh, store near you. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, this book is great, and the fir- the, the the first one is Tales for, is uh, uh, the Sunless Citadel, and uh, and and that's my math for it that I'll be running my players through. That is terrific. Ooh. All right, so that said, Nathan Holt and Sean Kornhauser of of Walk the Plains fame have been doing a new video series called Enter the Battlefield, with vignettes focusing on community folks like Christine Sprankle in the episode called Cosplay, and for Paul Cheon and the professor from Tularean Community College, subtitled Creators. Now, we know how impressive these guys are and how awesome it would be to be a subject yourself. What would your episode be about, Aaron? Well, uh, based on my love for zombies, my penchant for black decks, and backhanded compliments, my episode would be called Shade. Nice. That's that's pretty, Very pretty nice. hot fire. Ruben? Well, as someone who uh, uh, tries to weigh magic and D&D and poker evenly across my time, mm-hmm. and as someone who is best known for one specific show from my past, my episode would be called Balance and Counterbalance. <laughs> wow. That's, that's pretty good. Well, let me tell you, based on the fact that I've spent a good portion of my adult life creating content that gets new players into the game, watching Star Trek episodes, or hashtag five kids, my episode's name would certainly be The Next Generation. Yes. <laughs> Boldly You're going. You're single handedly making them. <laughs> Just, I, I make the generation. No man has gone before. That's right. And that ends another episode of Magic Mike's. Thank you for joining us here to discuss live all things magic. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you. 
You guys are great, and we're moving to our final slide. I want to thank you guys. For, I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, my co-hosts, Aaron and Ruben. You guys for watching, and hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mics. Visit our website at MagicMicsPodcast.com that exists thanks to our Patreon supporters. Or follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe to all the things social that tell people that we exist. Catch us online at Twitch.tv slash Magic Mics, on Twitter at Magic Mics Cast, on Reddit at Reddit.com slash R slash Magic Mics, and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Magic Mics. Talk to us privately at Magic Mics Podcast at gmail.com. Follow the audio only podcast podcast at magicmikespodcast.libsyn.com or find us on iTunes or join us here next week. Same time, same place for another episode of Magic Mikes. Good night, everybody. <laughs>